Have you ever been sitting in a meeting and think to yourself, man, this really could have just been an email? More so when the person who wants the meeting to continue is just sitting there talking about absolute nonsense about team building and in the lab and why you can't have Born in the USA blaring turned up to 11. I'm sorry, I thought this was America. Regardless, that was sort of this show. Now, I'm not bashing it outright. It was a good one, but I feel it would have served a better purpose in just being a movie. So that's just a heads up to y'all. Moving on. In the city of Houston in South Korea, some would say best Korea, an outbreak of an unknown virus would begin spreading slowly at first before becoming a major point of concern for the government and military as it began to spread beyond its borders. A former pharmaceutical employee turned teacher for the local high school has his son being relentlessly bullied and picked on. After attempting to solve it diplomatically, which failed due to the negligence of the police in school, the father would take things into his own hands. Studying what is rarely seen in nature, he decided to attempt to apply this to his son with disastrous results, developing a virus specific to him to help him with his fear of being picked on and subsequently not fighting back, the virus would subdue his fear but turn it into a blind rage and aggressive stance. This was not the desired outcome as you might have imagined. So in today's episode, we are all going to talk about the virus and outcome from All of Us Are Dead, which specifically pertains to the Jonas virus and the pathophysiology associated with some who are outright detrimentally infected to those that still seem to retain some form of control over their meat suits and possibly how one person in particular was just out right immune. All I have to say is just as a qualifier, this virus is going to require some suspension of disbelief because not only does the virus act like nothing that even exists on this planet, but the body's response to the virus doesn't act anywhere close to how the human body actually deals with viruses. That said, it doesn't matter because you can connect anything if you brute force the science enough. So let's get to it. So the first thing I want to say before kicking this thing off is this is a TV show. Now the previous joke I mentioned about how this could have just been an email, I mean I do feel like this would have made an excellent movie because it's pretty gripping. The issue is, once you stretch it over 12 hours, because it was a TV series, you start getting a lot of redundancy in the plot. But then again, you know, I'm not a TV show critic, it's just what I saw. That being said, if you haven't seen the show and like zombies, hey man, it's worth a watch. I'll be covering the summary here, so obviously spoilers ahead for the actual plot of the show. Even with that though, if you want a massively more detailed breakdown of the plot and its episodes, check out Wild Such Gaming's video over it, which should be either out before mine or shortly after. We aren't collabing or anything, he's just my boy and the dude puts in a lot of work on his videos. So using the time step up on screen you can jump ahead to bypass the summary but again there has to be spoilers in the science portion as well. So let's get into a super brief or as brief as I can make it because it's over 12 hours of content that I'm trying to condense down. Never done anything like this before so let's give it the old college try and let me know what you thought down in the comments. So we open up the story with a statement from your boy Roanoke. It's better to die on your feet than live on your knees. If you were ever just getting stomped out like this kid there's no shame in losing but turn a few knees caps backwards on your way out. A group of bullies is picking on a student, Jin Su, because he recently tried to take himself out of the game due to all the bullying that he was experiencing and he cited them. His father took him out of that high school after the diplomatic way failed, but the bullies have continued to find him nonetheless. As they are sitting there just pretty much absolutely shrekking him, to Jin Su's credit, he does attempt to fight back for the most part, but he's losing the fight because let's be honest, people who bully others never fight fair, which is why you go for the groin if you're outnumbered. But as Jin Su is launched off the roof, he hits the ground and then is brought to the hospital where we are now. Now, where his father comes to see him. Seeing as he's still turning, he ends up taking out his own son as he realizes this is the only option. That said, he still has got his mice back at the high school where a girl named Hyun Yu is bitten and infected with the virus. She ends up getting held captive by the teacher as the virus takes over her body before eventually escaping a few days later. At this point, she is completely transformed into a zombie or for the most part, and is an infected if you will. She's then brought to the infirmary of the school where she's held down as she begins to seem like she's convulsing, but really it's just going to her brain. This is where the nurse attempts to give her a shot to calm her. The nurse is then now bitten. Firefighters and paramedics arrive to take her out to the hospital and take off with her. As the nurse returns to her office, she begins to see the transformations take place. She ultimately exits her office and then begins attacking the students after two students found her and released her from that office. Also, there's one guy in this scene where the bullies are like picking on this guy and girl in the construction area. Again, you're ever in that situation, just start swinging away. You punch somebody in the face hard enough, I bet you they stop bullying you. So, as the zombie outbreak is in full effect now at Hyosun High, childhood friends Onjo and Chang Sun end up escaping the cafeteria, but just barely. This is where things start creeping along. At this point, it becomes essentially a game of hide and seek with a ton of students attempting to escape and steal off classrooms before getting absolutely got by those infected. As the group convenes and where they assume was one of the safe classrooms, a teacher is actually infected, which forces them to flee once more from their presumed safety and head towards the empty science lab. During the scuffle 
successful, however, Isaac becomes infected and then is thrown out the window in order to protect the rest of the group, which ends up screwing with Onjo. Meanwhile, back in the cafeteria, we meet the biggest douche in the universe, Guai Nam, and he is hiding in the cafeteria, and man, if they ever needed to make a better character to hate, this guy checks like all the boxes off, as I absolutely loathe him. As all this is happening, the archery team returns back to the high school to discover it's in the middle of a massive outbreak. Meanwhile, in the bathroom, Yun Suang, Ha Lim, and Mi Jin, and by the way, I suck at pronunciation, so don't make fun of me, are trapped in the restroom. And while all this is happening, the girl who was originally infected from the hamster that bit her has finally turned full zombie. She begins attacking other patients and medical staff at the hospital, leading to the infection breaking outside the confines of the school and slowly spreading throughout Hyosin. Realizing the group cannot stay in just a science lab, the group decides then that they need to head down to another level to find a more clear area. Using the fire hose, they tie up foot and handholds and throw it down, which goes directly to the broadcasting room. As they descend down one by one, they end up finding a surviving teacher, Miss Parks, down there. Although, no time to celebrate, because as they talk about what's happening, the zombie ends up coming down the fire hose, and they are forced to fight it off as Yang Su is scratched on the wrist by a broom handle. Nya Yan accuses him and belittles him, which causes an argument, until he agrees to wait in the broadcasting room for an hour, prove he's not infected. The wager is, is that if he's not, Nya Yun will apologize. However, that doesn't happen as Nya Yun basically comes in there after 30 minutes and continues to belittle him and then uses blood from the broom handle to infect him, sealing his fate. However, Nam Ra ended up seeing her do this, which causes the group to turn on Nya Yun. So she gets upset he's spaghetti over this and leaves voluntarily, although likely she would have been forced out. Miss Parks then scolds the rest of the group before going out to get her back. Bad move, Miss Parks. Let her perish out there, IMO. Due to Miss Parks' bad judge of character, she's then taken out later, as we learn. But back in the bathrooms, Mi Jin and Jun Soon are forced to take out Ha Lim's, and again, don't make fun of me, as she turns before being joined by the archery team's two survivors, Wu Jin's sister Ha Ri and Min Jae. Back in the kitchen, Guai Nam escapes after basically like sacrificing everyone in there. At this point, the military is called in as the virus continues to spread and attract the attention, which imposes then martial law and the evacuation of the residents who are infected. At this point, Chang Sun's mother sees a broadcast and then heads to the school to get her son while Anjo's father is at a government facility attempting to keep what's left of the local government safe. At this point, the creator of the virus is now arrested by Jai Ik, the detective. As Bai Yong Chan begins recounting why he even did it in the first place, he says his son would come home absolutely beaten up by bullies. He would tell his son to try to fight back, but it clearly wasn't in his nature. And I break away to say this, if you don't enjoy fighting, hey, you may even hate it, but if you don't like that, you don't have the fighting spirit, go take like a boxing class, learn some self-defense moves. That way you can end a fight before it becomes a long drawn out thing. Work smart, not hard. Anyways, as the detective listens to this, eventually Yang Chan begins to kind of sort of like regret what he's done as this was never his intention in the first place. He wanted his son to fight back. Realizing he spilled the spaghetti out of his pocket on this one, he tells the detective where the research is on his laptop back at the school. The detective then hears an alarm and exits the interrogation room with Yang Chan. The police station is then overrun as Byung Chan saves the detective and then Jai Ik is able to escape with his partner Ho Chul. Man, there are a lot of freaking names in this show. Anyways, back at school, Su Hyok and Chang Sun go to get a working phone as the students are forced to turn theirs in during the day. They end up getting separated from one another as Su Hyok returns to the group alone with Onjo rather dismayed over this. With Chang Sun hiding in the principal's room where he witnesses Guai Nam then take out the principal. As Guai Nam goes on to attack Chang Sun, they end up running through the infested school to the library. Also, the government officials are officially evacuated with Anjo's father. As the fight continues in the library, Shang Sun is able to get the upper hand on Guai Nam, though it doesn't look like it because, you know, he's kind of being choked out, but he's able to blind Guai Nam in the left eye before throwing him down where Guai Nam is then bitten several times and appears to be consumed. While this is happening, Guai Nam says that he's going to get revenge on Shang Sun. Oof. At this point, the rest of the group hatches a plan. Use the drone in the science lab to see the destruction and look for Shang Sun. Using the drone, one of the girls, Ji Min, sees her infected parents outside and attempts to off herself before getting stopped by the group. The archer team and the two in the bathroom decide that they need to head towards the training center to get more arrows and hunker down. Meanwhile, the police officers ironically take refuge in Shang San's fried chicken restaurant, where the girl from earlier, which I did never mention her, she just sort of has like a subplot, hid her baby and then tied herself up because she was infected. So now, Guai Nam wakes up after being infected and bitten all over and apparently has survived the infection process with his brain still functional and intact, although the infection would ultimately have an effect on his consciousness and decision-making processes. Waking up though, he continues to search for Shang Sun to seek out his revenge that he promised. Having used the drone to find Shang Sun, they inform him through the 
broadcast equipment that they're coming for him and that he needs to listen for once and stay there. Don't be a giant nerd and run out and get infected. They use music to distract the zombies on one side of the music room while they end up leaving the said room. Guainam, who heard the broadcast, goes after the group to murder Shang Tsung, and then at the staircase he encounters Su Hyuk, who had stayed behind to fight the zombies. Su Hyuk refuses to give up Shang Tsung, so Guainam attacks him. Nam Ra then joins in the fight but is bitten by Guainam before she and Su Hyuk push him out the window. Like Guainam, Nam Ra does not immediately transform. Shang Tsung, who earlier witnessed Guainam being bitten, argues for her to be taken out despite Su Hyuk's insistence that Guainam was not a zombie when he bit Nam Ra. Nam Ra stays by the window though, ready to jump if she turns. Su Hyuk then stays by her side. Nam Ra gradually enters a half zombified state and has an urge to bite Su Hyuk, but retains control of herself. After they argue about the potential risk of Nam Ra's situation, the students use a camera to record their last words in case they don't make it out alive. Unknown to them, inside of the adjacent PTA room, which is well stocked with food and water, Na Yan is alive, hiding from the zombies. The restroom survivors then fight their way out and enter the archery training center, but Jun Xiong is wounded. He's essentially just basically stabbed in the stomach. At the chicken restaurant, Jai Ik and Ho Chul save a young girl named Si Bin from the pursuing horde. Soju then breaks out of the quarantine zone and then heads for the school. And don't forget, Soju is Anjo's father. So now you know. With Nam Ra bitten, Su Hyuk says, I love you and I want you, as they share a kiss. With Nam Ra's infection, however, she begins displaying signs of heightened hearing, vision, and smell as she enters a half beast state. Anjo postulates that she's immune, which not really. Making their escape, they get to the staircases and they realize the door is locked and the absolute biggest loser is up there and doesn't let them out as he's rescued by the helicopter. And then he's asked like several times, is anybody else alive? He's like, oh, uh, no, nobody else is alive. Don't worry, he'll get his. While trapped, Shang Tsung finds himself fighting Guai Nam, who despite being yeeted out the window and snapping his neck, appears totally fine. Meanwhile, the restroom group developed a plan to escape to the mountains and GTFO. They build a stretcher for Jun Sung as he was injured in the last skirmish. But as they carry him out, it breaks, alerts the zombies, forcing them to run back inside. At this point, Anjo's father breaks into the police station and finds a force multiplier to use before heading to Hyosin High as the cops find a survivor on the roof who's actually a YouTuber. What a nerd who does that. But when Jai stops to get this YouTuber, Ho Chul nopes out of there as he's scared off by zombies and he takes Si Bin and the baby from earlier. After Nam Ra throws Guai Nim down the stairs, the survivors continue to knock on the door, which finally opens because Yoon Ji has actually lit the school on fire. However, they're a little too late as the military helicopter has left with Chul Su, whom they assume to be the school's sole survivor, which all they had to do was look out a friggin' window. The student makes an SOS distress signal in case another helicopter arrives. The restroom survivors, who also saw the helicopter, contemplate on whether to go to the rooftop where Zhang Sung suddenly tells the remaining three to leave him behind as he would slow them down. In the outside world, as Soju continues on his way to Hilson High to save Onjo, Jaik chats with a man he saved. The man reveals that he is a YouTuber nicknamed Born Gibberish, who came to Hilson to livestream any footage of the infected to dispel any nationwide rumors regarding the zombie crisis and also to gain more subscribers. Jaik reprimands him for unnecessarily putting himself in danger, but just then Ho Chul and the two children return to the kindergarten inside of a school bus. Both Jaik and Orange Jimberish jump onto the top of the bus as it drives off. They make their way through Hyosin and pick up Min Ji, a seemingly uninfected Hyosin high school student, also an outcast and victim of Guainam's bullying. Unknown to them, Yoon Ji is also in a half zombified state. They are soon picked up by the military and at the school during that night, the two different survivor groups bond separately. For the restroom survivors, Ha Ri teaches Mi Jin archery and they talk about their futures. The rooftop survivors gather around a campfire and talk about their past. Na Yan decides to bring the rooftop survivors some food after recalling her mistakes and Mrs. Park's sacrifice to atone for Guai Su's murder. However, Guai Nam kills Na Yan upon seeing her and ambushes the rooftop survivors. As a fight breaks out on the roof and Guai Nam is wrecking everyone, he eventually grabs Cheng Sun before Nam Ra throws him off the roof. With that problem seemingly solved, a helicopter then comes down as their mission is to retrieve the laptop. They say they will rescue everyone once their mission is completed. Getting the laptop, they begin loading up the students just as Unji turned aggressive and took out the coward on the roof from earlier, which he deserved, not gonna lie. The commander then tells the soldiers to leave behind the students, and as they question it, he then tells the soldier to fire. The soldier does, but up into the air, sparing them before reluctantly leaving the students behind. At this point, the whole plan has gone sideways. Realizing that Yunji is a half-turned zombie and they have no idea how she got through, she must be asymptomatic. They then realize that they can't bring any more citizens in so willingly, seeing as they really don't know how long the incubation period is, they halt any further evacuations until they can figure this out. However, through a stroke of luck, it begins to rain and thunder at the high school, giving everyone 
much needed water and blocking the senses of the zombies, Namra and Guainam included. The group decides that this is their chance and attempts to leave the school. As both groups attempt to make their way to the mountains, Shang Tsun sees his mom has been infected which causes a slight skirmish between the men of the group as Shang Tsun attempts to defend his zombified mother. Well, this was not a good plan as it attracts the attention of all the other zombies in the area and the rooftop survivors flee. They become separated during the escape with Namra, Su Hyuk, and An Jo struggling to get the distraught Shang Tsun to move while the rest, led by Dai Su, run through the woods. Hyo Hirong falls down and Ji Min, who is scared off by a nearby zombie, leaves her behind. As Ji Min tries to follow the others, she gets lost and then is taken out in the school's football field. Meanwhile, Hyo Rung is rescued by Wu Jin. He is reunited with Ha Ri, who rescued him as she led the restroom survivors through the woods. Together with Shang Tsung's group and the restroom survivors Wu Jin and Hyo Rung, who injured her leg during the fall, reunites with Dae Su's group, and they all gather at the school's auditorium. Immediately after, they enter the hall, Nam Ra, who can now sense zombies due to her half-zombified state, orders everyone to run to the auditorium's sports equipment room. During the horde's attack, Min Jae escapes from the auditorium and into the woods, while Zhang Xiong sacrifices himself to save Mi Jin, who is forcibly taken by the others into the sports equipment room, where they take shelter and mourn those that they just lost. The next day, the two different groups interact with each other, and they quickly bond. Dai Su confesses his affections for Hari, who now puts two and two together as to why he's always calling her brother brother-in-law, and then beats him up for it as she's not very impressed. Later, the survivors formulate a plan to use the sports equipment and metal carts to form a barricade to surround themselves while making their way out of the hall. As they carry out the plan, the zombie horde attacks them and Zhong Yong dies. Just as the zombies are about to overwhelm the barricade, the door suddenly swings open and Anjo sees her father, who finally reached the school, standing outside. Meanwhile, the military and scientists analyze the data of Yang Chan's laptop, and after the experts predict that the zombie epidemic might endanger the whole South Korean nation, the military decides to concussively force Hilson in order to prevent the virus from spreading to other parts of the country. So this whole time, Anjo has been terrified about losing her father, and as soon as she reunites with him, he gets caught in the tennis area. Woof. As the group retreats to the construction area, they are forced onto the building's unfinished balcony, but things aren't looking good. Namra is feeling it, Mr. Krabs, and is losing the fight to bite her friends and eat. Nagwai Nam then finds Min Jae in the archery area, and at first he says that he can live, but then smells Chang Sun on him, so he decides to turn him. As Min Jae takes a few shots at Gwai Nam, the muscular contractions become too much and throw off his aim. As the group remains on the balcony, Nam Ra hears an evacuation order as the military has found out that the zombies are attracted to specifically 24 megahertz on the sound spectrum and begin pulling zombies to different areas, one of those being Hyosun High School as it's about to be concussively forced. Gwai Nam now finds the group and immediately infects Shang Sun, which results in a fight as the rest of the group makes their escape. Shang Sun is able to push Gwai Nam off the roof as he enters a final confrontation with this giant douche canoe. The military then moves in as the group is able to escape the blast, sort of in the woods for the most part, but this results in the end of Shang Sun and Gwai Nam and also injures the leg of Dae Su, which everything now is consumed in fires, basically concerning the zombies. The commander at this point calls up his wife after taking full responsibility for what he's done and she yells at him apparently and it appears as though this was the basically last reach out he was going to do, but after the horrors he had to commit and then his wife yelling at him, it sort of seals the deal and he eats some lead with his wife texting him a few seconds later, apologizing for yelling at him and asking him when he will be home. <laughs> so now we get episode 12, which I didn't really understand why it had to be made, but let's wrap this thing up. The rest of the surviving group stayed out in the woods that night before heading to the neighboring town. They don't know if the infection has spread this far yet, but yes, it has. Now, to a degree anyways. The group is attacked once more after Nam Ra tells them to run, but they have injured, so they have to stay and fight. Wu Jin is bitten trying to save Ha Ri, which results in Nam Ra taking him out before he can infect others. Nam Ra is getting overwhelmed and starving at this point, so she lags behind to snack on a man witch as the others come to find her. She then abandons the group once they do as the remaining six come into contact with the military group. We now flash forward three months as the government ends martial law in Hyosun, but the residents must remain in quarantine as they don't know how long the incubation period still is. Onjo has been leaving the compound regularly and spots a fire on the school's rooftop. As the rest of the six survivors sneak out the next night with her, they go to see who lit the fire. It's Nam Ra and she wanted to spend time with her friends again. They tell her to come back with her to the quarantine area, but she refuses, saying that there are others like her in the area and they have created like a type of society over there. Nam Ra tells the others that she will be back as she jumps off the fourth story roof and takes off, leaving the others watching her as clearly she has evolved into something more than human. So with that wrapped up, I believe the first place we should start are the actual effects of the virus and then move on to the immunity displayed within some of the people. But 
but it appears to be more associated with a mental state than anything else, which I'll explain based on hormones released under certain pressures of the environment. Because isn't endocrinology a blast? Don't answer that, of course it is. So, the effects of this virus. The Jonas virus's original intention and creation was to mimic something that we see in nature occasionally by causing the body to undergo a similar physiological response to fear by basically having a predator on your tail. Whether that be an animal or just a tool from your class who needs his nose broken. Because a tool is a tool is a tool. In nature, it's rare, but Byung-Chan is correct in his observational studies. Most prey does not turn on a predator to defend itself. Choosing to flee most of times or just freeze, these exist because they were the most effective methods that allowed the animal to survive to go on to continue to spread its genes amongst the next generation. So effective is this strategy that it is the dominant form activated by their adrenal system. But as we all know, there is another and it is known as fight. Which just for your information, there are actually three outcomes as you might have guessed by what I just said. Fight, freeze, or flight. And there are different scenarios based on what you are witnessing. If something is actively attacking you right at that moment, your body will typically go into fight or flight. If injury sustained, it appears to be more in line with fight. If something is running after you, flight is activated as, who knows, you might be able to get away. That is unless you have a tool in your hand that is capable of putting that thing down, but even then you will feel the urge. And freeze happens a lot when you see something or notice an animal that may not have noticed you yet. That said, humans are loud and clumsy, so it most definitely has noticed you. These methods of survival are not necessarily unique to us as a species, but something to understand is we are predators in our own right. While we are not the biggest or strongest or have the sharpest claws, we are vastly superior in our intellect, which has helped us go from being regularly hunted by bigger animals to having everything on this planet essentially be at our mercy because humanity is always going to be number one. I don't care if anyone else doesn't basically agree, homo sapiens FTW. Anyways, pro-human mentality aside, we see something a little different with prey animals. They absolutely have the ability to fight back. Like if you walked in the woods right now and tried to fist fight a deer, that thing can absolutely shrek you because you are trying to fight it in a way that your body wasn't really designed to do. Prey animals will typically run or freeze. Impalas in the savanna actually will go as far as leaving their young behind along with other herbivores that do the same thing to outrun predators because that is the most successful method. Whereas fighting for a creature whose body is built on fleeing or freezing is not as effective. That's why it's so peculiar when you actually see prey fight back because despite their evolution and genes telling them to run, it's almost like there's a short circuit in their brain to a degree and while I doubt all fear is lost, it becomes an understanding of I can't outrun it, I can't hide from it, all I can do is fight. And with that, all focus and energy is put into a last ditch effort to save the animal's life. What's even stranger is predators may not necessarily know what to do in this instance. This equates to human interaction as well. Like you ever sock someone in the gut who's been messing with you? And I mean like, I'm talking like you absolutely crumple them. Well, strangely, they usually don't fight back. Instead, they just kind of leave you alone after that because at the end of the day, humans are animals too. I'm also required to say after saying that sentence, uh, I don't condone that. Anyhow, when prey fights back, predators may choose to run because the fight isn't worth it. And this is what Byung Chan wanted for his son, which is also why he told him to fight back in the first place. Because again, I'm not saying you should do that, but I'm also saying observational history says that it does work. Take that for what you will. The next question becomes, what exactly did Byung Chan harvest in the prey that fought back? So I just have to say something real quick, as mentioned way earlier. This whole set of events is fairly strange overall because this is not how viruses work. They work in the show, they just work way too fast. And this is also not how a body responds to an infection. But I think there may be a way to explain this despite the pathophysiology being literally all over the place. Byung Chan talks about how there was a hormone in rodents that would cause them to fight back. Now it's easy to think, oh, this is just adrenaline. But really, adrenaline gears the body up physically for the actual fight, flight, or freeze by sending blood away from the organs and to the muscle, and it ensures movement and stamina will be there for whichever you choose to do. But with freeze, something else happens. Happens. The perception of time dilates. This is why people who are scared say time slowed down. You are literally perceiving things differently, and if I recall, it feels like it adds about an extra half second per second, which ends up adding up. This gives your brain the ability to work out what to do in the resulting freeze. Seeing as that's what adrenaline does to the meat suit, the next thing has to come into play. The rodent hormone causing it fight, which is why Byung Chan was attempting to do and eventually figured out how to successfully implement it into the human body. The concept came about likely at first just as injecting the hormone in the body of a son. This, however, would not be effective because hormones don't just build up in your body. Otherwise, that would absolutely be useless as a messenger system. Hormones are required to eventually break down. So instead, he needed the help of a virus to implant RNA into the cells so the body would make it itself. But I would suggest it goes further than that. The virus would work like any other virus. It would carry the genetic coding associated
associated with the hormone and how to build it. Upon injecting its contents into the cell of his son at a rapid rate all over his body, the cell would officially have access to building this hormone. However, something seems to have gone wrong, which I would likely trace back to the virus selected. While Byung-chan was attempting to go for a limiting response, only release if scared, which would have been the mRNA built up in the cell of a person, which the ribosomes would then use and then read to create the hormone. Which, if you didn't know, this is a biology channel. There are protein and there are lipid hormones, so now you know. I believe where things went awry with choosing the virus is once mRNA is translated and created into a protein, typically it's destroyed so it does not build up. However, with the zombies running around and infected, it's clear this hormone is not clearing from their system, and as a result, it must be sustaining itself within the cells, which may also explain how it's actually affecting cells later. Something to know about animals in our species, long-time watchers will know I've mentioned this before, but for new people, roughly 8% of our genetic coding are a direct result of leftover material from ancient viruses. If you didn't know, specific viruses will just straight up encode themselves into your genes, which there is a hypothesis floating around out there that this is kind of may of what forced prokaryotes on the pathway to become eukaryotes as the viruses infected and caused a cell to invade another cell, almost like it was a virus itself. Fairly interesting, but the point I'm making is that viruses will absolutely encode themselves into your DNA in certain events. Take the current virus. By all accounts, it does not appear to even go near your DNA, so that's a good thing to hear, but viruses containing reverse transcriptase and integrase do. Take herpes, for instance. The reason it's such a little douche canoe is that it actually integrates into your DNA and occasionally will just come back if that specific sequence is translated. That's why it's a lifelong disease for now until we use CRISPR to wipe it from an infected person's body. But this is what I believe may be happening with the Jonas virus. Byung-Chan should have been more careful in the selection of the virus of choice because rather than it keep it at an mRNA level outside of the nucleus, he instead may have inadvertently selected a virus that contains its own reverse transcriptase and integrase, which means the hormone responsible for the lack of fear and complete aggression is integrated into the cellular DNA itself. With this being in the DNA of a person, this would have several effects on the body, and you can clearly see what these are, but the main one being they can't snap out of the mental state that they are in once the cell starts releasing this hormone, which may hint at why certain people react differently to their specific infection. But mostly across the board, they typically react the same. It would appear that your mental state is the determining factor when you are infected based on the hormones currently in your body at time of infection. But before moving on to explain this, we must first understand what happens to your body upon your infection, which we will use the standard infected as the model for this since it seems to be more common in the population. First, the virus is strange in how it infects someone. For instance, when it comes to a knockdown drag out brawl, zombies are bleeding in people's mouth all over their eyes and their mucosa membranes. Judging by what we have seen when Nayeon infects Gyan Su, the infected blood is more than capable of infecting an entire person through a scratch despite being exposed to the atmosphere for an extended period of time, which suggests the virus is stable outside of a host environment, at least for a little while. Now, this is possible. Uh, things like the current virus, for instance, can exist on surfaces for three hours, whereas HIV, if it exists outside the body, for even just a little bit, it pretty much degrades within seconds. So this is the biggest issue with the virus overall. It appears selective when it infects, and I think this is for the plot. If you're getting that much blood on you in a fight, you are absolutely going to become infected. But apart from the blood being infectious, there's also other ways that the infection tends to spread. For instance, it would seem as though the virus will jump from the blood to the salivary glands, allowing a bite to deliver an infectious load of viruses into the bloodstream of another person. This method appears rather effective in transmitting the virus from those who are infected to those who are not, thus propagating the virus. Now, something to know about this virus, I'm saying virus a lot, is while it appears stable in outside environments, at least for a little while, it is hinted throughout the entire show that the virus is mutating to stay alive. It's also hinted at that the virus forces your cells to begin attacking the weaker cells, which, all right, it seems like something may have been lost in translation here, so let me see if I can explain what I believe the show is saying, because likely the native language is explaining it a lot better. First, let's start with the apparent sentience of the virus. I severely doubt this. I don't think the virus is so much thinking as it's really just has a higher rate of mutagenicity. The virus RNA itself is able to mutate quickly and adapt to the body in specific ways that allow it to infect much more effectively as it is able to escape the human immune system countermeasures. This is also why I don't believe the idea of certain people have antibodies to combat the virus and this leads to partial immunity because the reality is antibody production takes days as the adaptive immune system needs to be activated and made aware of the virus attacking. But since the Jonas virus changed 
rages so much, that would mean that the body would not be able to properly form a response to it, as it's impossible to develop the antibody quick enough to subdue a virus in the first place that is mutating this much. So I believe there is no immunity to this virus, meaning that it has a 100% infectivity rate. The other effect the virus has, which is completely bizarre, is the ability to change from infected to non-infected at will, or at least that's what it's perceived to be. The reality is, for it to change its presentation but also be reliant on the body, then the body must be causing the virus to present in different ways. It is said the virus chooses, but I also severely doubt this is the case, seeing as viruses are not sentient. Depending on which microbiologist you ask, they're also not even considered alive based on their opinions. Now, do I consider actual viruses to be alive? It can be argued that they are and they are not, because they do check off some of the boxes for life, and then they don't check off other boxes. So actually, I believe it's more of an issue with our categorizing system as a species. So the last effect the virus appears to have on the typical person, which again, may be a translation issue, is the stronger cells attack the weaker cells. Now, what I believe this is actually referring to is an autoimmune issue. The stronger cells of the body are clearly the immune cells, seeing as they have the ability to absolutely destroy standard cells. And because this and their subsequent infection, it seems like a specific piece of the coding is broken when infecting immune cells or even when infecting a regular body tissue cell. Within the body is a system set in place that typically stops the immune system from attacking its own self, or at least concerning cells in the body that they are all part of the same multicellular organism. And this is known as the major histocompatibility complex, or just MHC, which are proteins which reside on the surfaces of cells. This will designate a host cell as a literal host cell versus a bacteria cell, lacking these, indicating that it is not part of the organism and should be disposed of. In humans, this complex is the human leukocyte antigen. The immune cell can read these markers and understand, hey, this cell's supposed to be here. It's very important for your body to not attack itself. Issues do happen naturally, though. Again, through things like autoimmune disorders, the immune system will either not recognize this complex or a presenting marker on the surface will indicate to the immune cell that your cell shouldn't be there based on a chance that the immune cell actually gets through the selection process with the incorrect co-receptor that fits the body cell's receptor, which triggers an immune response and the destruction of that body cell. I believe that it's more evidence that this virus was accidentally chosen as it inserts into the genetic coding of the host. With this happening, the gene has to go somewhere and it may actively be inserting itself into the genes associated with own body cell recognition. This ultimately results in what the show says about strong cells attacking weak cells, which just happens to coincide with the hormone release that the body has access to now as well. So basically, as the hormone releases, it's also releasing these viral particles simply because the coding is right there either next to each other or codes for the same thing. This has a profound effect beyond just the release of the hormone under certain environmental conditions. It would also appear to be influenced by other hormones in the body. But before this final point, let's talk about examples that we see in the meat suits of those infected. When a person is infected, the virus spreads quickly through the bite site. For some, it appears to take a little longer, but the infection is all but assured. Attacking every single cell around it, blood cells and any cell currently located within the bloodstream would be the first to be besieged. Entering those cells, they would implant their DNA into that cell and begin forcing the cell to obviously create more copies of itself and of the hormone. This means likely it's a multi-strand event concerning genetic coding implantation. Spreading around the body quickly, it would easily seep past the blood-brain barrier and begin infecting neurons as clearly no cell is immune. After saturating the blood faster than any virus we have ever witnessed, damage to the blood cells is all but assured after the inflammatory response of macrophages is released. Think of it like the body having the seizure-like effect while the cells are undergoing a similar event as likely functions of the cell are forcibly conducted, which leads to some secondary effects. Like again, inflammation, which caused the blood vessels to become leaky, like what we see in the sclera of the eyes. We can assume that this is happening all over the body. After a few moments passes, the virus has entered the nervous system from the bloodstream, and then the virus forcibly causes the functions to begin once again. And if this is to be believed, this causes a massive discharge of the nervous system to the point that muscular contractions contract so hard it begins pulling bone in odd positions, seeing as our body does potentially have the ability to do this to a degree through muscular contractions anyhow. During the infection, once the massive discharge of the nervous system takes place, it would appear the heart contractions are disrupted as well, likely leaving it in a state of just straight up contraction until the virus takes fully over. 
there's no reason to think the heart muscle itself isn't affected by the same virus as it's pumped through. Once the heart is stopped, this renders the person unconscious, where they will either keep contracting for a few moments more, where we can now assume the heart is then started back up later in certain individuals, whereas in others, it does not appear to restart, but I believe there may be a reason for this, or at least a more delayed restart. For some, once the infection sets in, the heart will remain stopped. Their cognitive ability will begin to degrade within six minutes as the brain continues to degenerate due to the lack of oxygen. It's probable that eventually the heart does restart to keep the infected alive, but not before severe brain damage is achieved, leaving them with no memory of who people are, even when it comes down to their own children, and really just leaving them with a sense of instincts. But prior to this, we see in Gyeongsu, as he is turning, he sees the faces of his friends twist and contort into hellish beings, which continues to frighten and scare him until he ultimately turns. This is a big clue as to what the virus is actually interacting with, and again, it all comes down to the endocrine system. I believe hormones currently circulating around your meat suit at the time of infection play the biggest role in how the actual body turns out post-infection. So let's take a look at that for a moment. You see this with most people. They are afraid. I mean, someone's trying to rip out your trapezius muscle with their bare teeth. I mean, that'll do that to a person. But what is released with fear? Cortisol and adrenaline. Cortisol has been known to cause heart attacks if not monitored long term or in large enough doses. This hormone is essentially the fear hormone. Most who are afraid have this circulating in large amounts and with the addition of the Jonas virus rodent hormone that their body creates shortly after infection, this would cause their heart to stop, but also that much fear causes them to hallucinate at the end. With the fear hormone, cortisol circulating around their body before their heart stopped, this triggered the co-hormone or in some way triggered the cell to release this co-hormone, which results in a violent rage and causes them to fight against a predator despite the predator being absent. So the key is, don't be afraid when you get bit, but considering it's a biological response, good luck trying to control that. We do see examples though of people being somewhat frightened, but another emotion overtakes them at the end, which results in a different outcome for their bodies. When Guainam was infected, he was experiencing rage, like literally vowing to track down an end Shang San. Because of this, we can assume it's much like any other human bodily response. Cortisol levels dipped and testosterone levels increased as anger and rage do. When he was infected, the absence of a high amount of cortisol, or at least a massive amount of it, stopped the triggering of the rodent hormone from overtaking his body and turning him into one of the mindless infected. Although the reality is, even with this being the case, he's still very much so infected. So this would mean that those infected, it's like a feedback loop that gets stuck. As cortisol levels increase, the rodent hormone also increases. But as the rodent hormone increases, cortisol levels increase. And this just creates a runaway effect as each keep increasing each other until you're pretty much redlining, which means you're just enraged. So the second person, Yoon Ji, who upon her infection was not angry, but instead just had an intense hatred for those at the school, was disgusted also with the dude upstairs. Driven by this hatred and disgust, again, her cortisol levels would not have been as high, so her infection did not turn out like the others. Not to mention, she was just about to jump off a roof, so she wasn't really too afraid. The third person, Nam Ra, acting out of love for Su Hyuk, when she was bitten, she is not necessarily scared and likely still had oxytocin floating around her body with decreased cortisol levels. So because of this, again, she does not turn, and by the end of the show, she actually appears to have her infection completely controlled and is able to do things well beyond what an average human can, which we will go over the effects of the virus momentarily, like at least physically, and why these differences even appear. But the fourth person is the actual creator of the virus himself, Byung Chan. After not being afraid to sacrifice himself to the infected to save the detective, it later turns out he's alive and conscious as well. All these examples show that if a person was in a different state besides just blind fear, then the rodent hormone applied to their physiology never presented. But only when those half infected did no fear did their more zombified side finally come out, albeit they still had some control. This is indicated when the infection is seen in Nam Ra's face when Guai Nam begins his attack on the roof. Cortisol levels are what cause the hormone to present itself, which is likely why Yun Ji would sometimes test positive for the virus and other times not. Hormone is produced by the body and so too is the virus, but the virus enters cells so quickly that only when she was scared did the virus actually come out into the bloodstream. Lastly, the effects on the body are quite strange for the half beats. We see at first it's subtle. Their sense of smell increases. They can hear a little better and their strength begins to increase. I believe the hormones released in small amounts may act in some part on the adrenal system of the body allowing for heightened senses, but it would also appear that the virus has a physical, tangible impact on the body as well, more specifically interacting with the muscular, skeletal, and neurological areas of the body. Skeletally, it's clear the body is more durable considering Namra jumps off a four-story building and presumably just landed and was fine. This would indicate that the bone mass has been added to the body, which is likely 
likely also what is driving their insatiable hunger as well. Their bodies are essentially growing for all intents and purposes and require nutrition, no matter what it is, to achieve this. With mindless zombies, it's anything that moves, which includes humans. With those that are still conscious, unless starving and overwhelmed, they can likely eat normal food as well, but will turn on humans if overcome with hunger. Muscular systems are also increased either in contractility or size, but we don't really see with Namra that she's increased in muscle mass, so it would appear that contractility was increased to account for this strength. Considering the conscious are able to throw one another around quite easily, as well as the non-infected, in fact, it took an entire group just to get Guaynam subdued, and then Namra had to basically step in, the muscle must be at its full potential, because if you didn't know, with humans, we actually only contract about 30% of our actual strength, maybe 50% with training. It's a limiting factor that allows us to not injure ourselves. With this, our bodies last longer. With the infected, it appears they can bypass this and contract at full strength, which is also why someone was able to snap bones in their spine like a twig, but also why Guainan was able to fix his broken neck after he was yeeted out a window. The muscle possesses strength, and the infection is able to pull bones back into place. The virus also appears to directly impact the nervous system by allowing the signal strength to contract to be much stronger, but also repair the nervous system itself by likely inducing mitotic division should the body be gravely injured, which isn't really that far-fetched considering the rest of the body is growing in several different ways. Unlocking the mitotic pathway of the nervous system once more, which we used to have, at least when our bodies were being built, and it's like I get why our nervous system does not want to undergo mitotic division, because that would actually probably change everything about the way we think, because literally you're adding new neurons, but it still just seems kind of like it'd be a great thing to have in the rest of our nervous system. But we see this is being done with Guainam when he regains control of his meat suit and is crawling along outside. His left arm and right leg don't work, and by the way, the screen's flipped, just so you know. But a short while later, everything but his left arm is functional until eventually he's completely good. For this to happen, the muscle pulled the snapped vertebrae back into position and the spinal cord healed itself. For all intents and purposes, this would be an excellent virus if it weren't turning people into mindless zombies. Anyhow, this gives us even more clues that it's affecting the DNA of a person it infects, because for it to unlock the mitotic pathway in the nervous system, it would need to actually impact the DNA. Seriously, Mr. Dr. Professor Psychopath could have just picked the correct virus and this whole thing would have been fine. So the very last point, which I promise you, Matt, isn't very long, is observed outright immunity to the disease. We see those that are infected but maintain consciousness. The infected do not even pay attention to them or basically can't register them as different from themselves. Well, you know who this happened to, like, a lot throughout the show, but it's never really, like, massively paid attention to, but there's sort of hints to it? Anjo. Remember the cafeteria scene? The zombies had no issue jumping everyone immediately. One literally gets right in front of Anjo's face and stops, much like it did with Guainam when he was yelling at them after his infection. Another example of her possible immunity is when the hamster was on her leg. Why did it show that if it wasn't meant to bite her? It bit the other girl, but for some reason it never did anything to Anjo. Instead, it appears everything that is infected just seems to ignore her like she was already infected, or just not register at all, based on the amount of close calls that she's had, yet no symptoms of infection ever arose because even when she was scared, she just doesn't display anything that would indicate she contains the Jonas virus. And this was really just more food for thought. 